the publisher pulls out all the stops to build readership. He wanted readers, and, it, and he was accused of doing anything to get readers for his newspaper. And it might be true, he didn't leave much out. Uh, Razzle-dazzle journalism, all kinds of grand and glorious coverage to crime and other uh, popular topics. All kinds of bizarre and, and weird and wonderful contests to, uh, to get readers to buy the star. One wildly popular star contest urges Toronto's children to catch the largest number of flies. Every summer, Toronto is infested with clouds of flies from the city's livestock. Atkinson and Dr. Charles Hastings, the medical officer of health, devise a crusade, masquerading as a contest. The fly has got no friends and doesn't deserve any. He carries disease to the baby and fills the city cemetery. Swat the fly, and you may save a baby's life. There was a $25 first prize, which at that point in time, this is the beginning of a recession, huge amount of money, um, particularly for children from the slum areas, which would be parts of the city that would generate the largest number of flies. Toronto's children catch 3.3 million flies. And one of the big winners is 14-year-old Beatrice White. She manages to kill an amazing half a million insects. This is the first of many collaborations between the star publisher and health officer Dr. Hastings. None would be more successful than the fight to clean up Toronto's bad milk. Hastings has a very personal commitment to the milk campaign because one of his daughters died from drinking bad milk. It had a lot of germs in it that caused disease like typhoid and diphtheria and scarlet fever. When they analyzed it, it was shocking how filthy it was. If you fed this to a small infant, they would sicken and die, and it was just viewed as one of those things that happened to many babies. But it does, needless to say, start ringing significant alarm bells for parents and the medical profession and um, Joseph Atkinson. Pasteurization of the city's milk finally becomes compulsory in 1914, but it will be many more years before people accept milk as a health food. Extra, extra, read all about it. Every day the star hits the streets, it's a small victory for Joseph Atkinson. He has to fend off blatant product promotions by his financial backers, while keeping the real stories about the downtrodden on the front page. He was always conscious that the people who buy the paper every day were the people who mattered in his life, not the people who loaned him money and uh, wanted a voice in the board of directors because he considered their advice to be foolish, wrong, and immoral. Atkinson knows that advertising is the star's lifeblood. Every night, he and Almina perform the same ritual, holding their breath as they tally up the ads in that day's paper. But the need for ads doesn't stop Atkinson from launching a costly campaign. It exposes price-fixing cartels that gouge the public. The first to be brought to justice are 150 plumbers. Over the next five years, the star smashes many of the other 80 price-fixing rings that exploit families. Atkinson recruits a brilliant editor in Harry Hindmarsh to drive his reporters. Hindmarsh will eventually become Atkinson's son-in-law, and it's his job to spell out what's news and what isn't. My first impressions were it was just exactly as I'd seen in the movies, very exciting, noisy, and exciting shouting, reporters pounding the stories out and yelling, boy. Everybody sort of came to attention. That was the first time I saw Mr. Atkinson. He came in through the editorial department, very, very neatly dressed, always had uh, a crease in his trousers, just as sharp as a razor. I found out he was the big boss. He was the 
and the president of the paper and the publisher and whatnot. Oh, yes, I was frightened. Atkinson also strikes a note of fear into the hearts of the privileged rich with his incessant calls for a wealth tax. He clashes with his biggest advertiser, Sir John Eaton, head of the department store chain. Privately, Eaton views Atkinson's radical policies as Bolshevism and in 1921 pulls all his advertising from the star. The boycott is supposed to bring Atkinson to his knees, but it also hurts sales at Eaton's. The year-long, costly standoff only ends when Sir John dies suddenly at 46. The Eaton ads quickly return to the star. But behind his titanic newspaper struggles, Atkinson also displays the human touch. He launches two campaigns that will change the lives of Toronto's needy children. In the early 20th century, Toronto is a cruel, heartless place. Men and women often abandon their children to the gutter and a life of drunkenness and crime. Joseph Atkinson's star devotes front page coverage to their misery. Every reporter is assigned to write about the slums. Even a young Ernest Hemingway, who kept this star story in his private papers all his life. Her husband had left her with three more small children to provide for. She had worked until she had become a shadow, but she would never give up. She worked for them. She starved for them. She literally gave them her body. When a woman begins to sacrifice, there is no limit except death. Children were living on the street. The loss of a job, a low-paying job for, for a single mother of three, uh, basically meant uh, you're, you're on the street. Uh, sweatshop opportunities for, uh, for children that we now rail against in terms of, of other uh, third world countries. But Atkinson saw progress of the nation, progress of Toronto, through the prism of what we did with children. In 1901, Joseph and Elmina Atkinson decide to give slum children a day's respite from the hot, fetid city streets. They take over the Fresh Air Fund, first established by their friend John J. Kelso, founder of the Children's Aid Society. Each year, the fund hires pleasure boats to whisk the children around the Toronto Islands. Later, the program is expanded to give children two weeks holiday in summer camps. Elmina is deeply moved by the early Fresh Air Fun trips, all paid for by readers. The Eurydice was crowded with a mob of bad little boys and good little boys, and girls who would have been pretty had they been clean. Besides these were the mothers, tired, dispirited, often with an air of former gentility, and too often carrying on their faces the marks of their unfortunate lives. For some children, winter brings festive cheer. For others, little more than cold comfort. So in 1906, the Atkinsons launched the Star's Santa Claus Fund, distributing Christmas gifts to every child under 12 from destitute families. Once the two funds were well established and run six months a year, Elmina Atkinson gradually withdraws from the Star Newsroom. Now there will be more time for her own family, daughter Ruth and son Joseph Story. And Elmina has firm views on raising children. What is right for a woman is right for a man. A girl should read the same books her brother should read. 
In most of the books for girls, there are too many dolls and too much tears.